In the realm of football, Terry Venables enjoys the status of a king and until recently, control of his own castle. As a player, he won the FA Cup and remains the only Englishman to represent his country at every level of the game. Inside, inside, inside. You're still in contact. Bring him up. When Venables converted from player to coach, the success continued. Under his guidance, both Crystal Palace and Queen's Park Rangers won promotion. He returned to Wembley with QPR for the 1982 FA Cup final. Having conquered Britain, he faced his biggest challenge as manager of Barcelona. He wasted little time, winning the European Cup during his first season in charge. Flags were unfurled in his honour and Terry Venables was crowned El Tel, the finest coach in Europe. As a player, he always was quite a, a thoughtful midfield player. And um, a lot of questions used to be asked, you know, from coaches and managers that he used to play under. Um, so he was absorbing that information then. And then, of course, when he went into the management coaching side, he was always re recognised and, and still is as a, a very th thoughtful tactician. As a coach, I think he's been one of the uh, most successful ones that this country have produced. Venables had one great ambition. In 1991, he formed a partnership with Alan Sugar and took control of Tottenham Hotspur. He was already manager of the club, but to move from the bench to the boardroom, he needed three million pounds. Although not a rich man, Venables raised the money. But within two years, the marriage had collapsed. Venables was sacked, and the court case, with all its costs, forced him to sell his shares. The announcement came at the beginning of this month. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Long time I see. <laughs> OK. Except for a nominal holding, which I intend to retain, I have sold all my shares in Tottenham Hotspur PLC. I intend to resign as a director of the company also. Venables says he has lost a million pounds in the process and claims that neither he nor the supporters have been told why he was removed from the club. Tonight, Panorama reveals for the first time how Terry Venable's unscrupulous business practice led to his dismissal from Tottenham Hotspur. We will show how his ambition to purchase Spurs led him to unlawfully obtain a million pounds. The programme also reveals how he abused his position as Tottenham's chief executive and how his personal advisor tried to cheat a major financial institution. The only public reason given for the sacking of Terry Venables involved his choice of advisers, some of whom were employed at Tottenham Hotspur. The individual who attracted the greatest attention was his financial advisor, Eddie Ashby. Venables was to hire Ashby as Spurs general manager at a salary of £90,000. It was Paul Revere who first introduced Ashby to Terry Venables. Revere ran a highly successful financial services company, selling pensions and other policies. As a football fanatic, he became part of the London soccer scene. In 1989, he and Venables began working together on the development of a new board game. They called it The Manager, and it was an attempt to recreate the excitement of running a football club. Paul Revere spent 15 months developing the game, and then formed a company to promote it. The company was called Glen Hope Management, and its two other directors were Eddie Ashby and Terry Venables. Once on sale, it scored an immediate hit. It was very successful. Um, it was launched in Harrods, I think, in August 1990, and uh, got off to a very good start. We sold virtually all of the big departmental stores, and I think we sold 25,000 by the beginning of the next year, um, taking into account the uh, Christmas sales, and uh, looked to be running a, a pretty good profit. After working without pay for 15 months at their first floor offices in Prince's Gate, Paul Revere was short of money. 
he decided to make his first substantial withdrawal from the Glenhope bank account. I remember that we thought there was probably about £34,000 there. But the guy who obviously controlled the purse strings and dealt with all the financial side was Eddie Ashby. And when I asked him to tell me what actually could be taken out of the company, because I was experiencing cash flow problems, I found to my horror that there was no money there. Edward Moses Ashby has been involved in a number of businesses. The vast majority have been failures. He has been a director of 43 companies. 16 are in receivership, 8 in liquidation, and 15 are in the process of being struck off. Of the remaining four, there are no details. Eddie Ashby had taken thousands of pounds from Glen Hope's offices and transferred it to another company, without Paul Revere's knowledge. Ashby was doing the same thing at another Venables business. In April 1991, Terry Venables bought into Scribes West. Scribes is a high-class private club in Kensington, which had run into financial difficulties. One of Venables' first moves was to bring in Eddie Ashby as the club's finance director. Despite using Venables' name to attract soccer stars and other celebrities, the club continued to lose money. Geoffrey Van Hay, Scribes' managing director, saw Venables as the last chance to ensure the club's survival. He also knew that Venables was keen to expand his own business empire. Mr. Venables saw Scribes as a launching pad in his business world. I think he thought that having such an elegant premises would attract the right people. He loved being Mr. Venables, Scribes West. International. Two senior members of Scribes, Gavin Hans Hamilton and Noel Botham, soon found that Venables wanted to take control of the club. He promised to invest £50,000 and once again he appointed Eddie Ashby as finance director. Key Scribes accounts were then moved to the offices of Glenhope. We were told that he was putting in £50,000. Later, when I asked had the £50,000 been actually invested, I was told by Gavin and Van, not actually in the club bank account. And I said, well, what does that mean? Well, another bank account has suddenly appeared. And apparently the money has been paid into that. And I said, why apparently? Well, we don't have access, they said, to that bank account, or to any of the statements, or to the checkbook. This was part of the um, initial um, purge, if you like, by the Venables team, was that um, Geoffrey Van Hay in my role was only to run the club, and that all our efforts were to be concentrated on that, and we would have nothing to do with the financial aspect of the running of the club, and that would all be handled by Eddie Ashby and Terry Venables. During the summer of 1991, Scribes received a document which was to shock the shareholders. It was the latest development in the business life of their finance director and led to his formal resignation. Gavin read it and said, oh my God, look at this. And it was a piece of paper uh, informing us that Mr. Ashby was a bankrupt. Um, I certainly knew that it would be, it's illegal for anyone who's a bankrupt to be uh, on the board of a a company. Did that end Eddie Ashby's relationship to Scribe? No, not at all. What do you I, mean? Well, he continued to, to run the finances of the company. He was still um, signing checks uh, and he was still controlling the finances. Was that with Terry Venable's consent? Well, it must have been, yes. Another Scribe's director was Paul Revere. He learnt that despite the club's financial condition, Eddie Ashby had been taking money out of the company. As before, it was called an intercompany loan and was intended to finance another company. I discovered in Scribes that um, the money had been taken from Scribes to pay the wages of the workforce of a print company. 
Did you agree with that? Didn't know anything about it. Panorama has discovered that money transferred from Scribes and Glenhope was destined for this Essex printing works. Print Double had been manufacturing the manager board game, but it was to become part of Eddie Ashby's attempt to build an illusory business empire, cheat the banks and raise money. The company had substantial assets and Ashby agreed to invest a six-figure sum. Company secretary Chris Bohe expected the money to arrive in Print Double's bank account but only one payment of £20,000 was deposited. Subsequent payments were late. This meant Print Double had no time to clear checks. The rest of the money was paid over in cash in about half a dozen drops of about £5,000 in 20s and £50 notes. How did you actually come across the money? We, they asked us to meet them on a lay-by just up the A10, which we wait in a lay-by, and, and a member of Glenhope turned up and uh, wound down his window and handed the money over. Did you know where the money came from? Uh, it came from a couple of occasions that he said it came out of Glenhope. Once he said it came out of Scribes, that's a raid Scribes to get the money. They're the only two places where they said it actually came from. He said they had to raid Scribes? Yeah. What did he mean by that? They had no money in Glen Oak and they had to get the money out of Scribes. Although the money came from those companies, it was routed through a venture capital company called Elite Europe. Alan Roberts, Print Double's managing director, was told it was backed by Terry Venables, though quite what he knew is unclear. Elite Europe were going to have a 30% interest in the new company. We needed the £150,000 from day one. Um, but it took us probably 10 weeks uh, and over the, the first 10 week period uh, they actually advanced about £50,000. Eddie Ashby was not registered as a director of Elite Europe though he always behaved as one. He identified a number of companies in serious financial trouble and then added them to his paper empire. Print Double gave the empire credibility because it had a large number of assets. More typical was the independent balloon company, which was on the verge of receivership. Sue Cooper was one of four partners in the company. She advertised in a Sunday newspaper, and Eddie Ashby replied, again using Terry Venable's name. I was quite impressed with Mr. Ashby. They seemed to be um, financially secure. Um, we, at the end of the day, got balance sheets. Um, they had their bank accounts at Coots. Uh, Mr. Venables was regularly mentioned as having an interest in the company, um, although I'm not sure what that interest was. Um, so yes, initially I was impressed. IBC, the independent balloon company, was to receive £15,000 from Elite Europe. Elite was also going to take on IBC's outstanding liabilities, but the money never arrived. And any profits IBC did make were kept by Elite Europe. I feel that they um, conned us, in a sense, you know. They, they let us down very badly, and our creditors, you know. Um, so, no, they didn't behave ethically, and I'm not sure if they behaved legally. It doesn't seem to. They, they took our money, they took our stock, they gave us nothing in return. They just left us with the debts at the end of the day. Another virtually worthless company, which Ashby claimed was part of Elite Europe, was Weatherall Baccarat. He'd had previous connections with the Weatherall Clothing Company in Liverpool, but after a boardroom battle, he was forced out. David Hodgkinson was on the board of Weatherall's when Eddie Ashby was also a director. He recalls that the company was in receivership, but Ashby still claimed it was part of the elite Europe empire. I was surprised to hear, on seeing some detail of a company called Elite Europe, uh, in the ownership, I understand, of Edward Ashby, that he had listed in January 1991 Weatherall's as one of his assets and was purporting a potential turnover of £150,000 a year with a net profit of £27,000 a year when at that stage the company was in receivership and to my knowledge there was no potential whatsoever for Ed Edward Ashby to trade under the Weatherall trade name. Ashby was to use Elite to persuade finance houses to make substantial loans. It was shown with six apparently profitable companies. 
It said Wetherill Baccarat was successfully trading, but the company had been dissolved. Ashby also distributed a balance sheet, showing it had net assets of £597,000. This too was untrue. The balance sheet included Print Double's plant and equipment, but not its liabilities. I know they were trying to raise money on our machinery and our assets to put, supposedly to put into our company. Whether it, if they'd have been successful in doing that, the money would have come into our company, I can't say, but that's the opinion I've got they were trying to do. Is that fraud? Oh, that is fraud, because all the machines were covered by HP Grimms anyway. The balance sheet fraud collapsed. Print Double realised they were being quoted by Ashby as a wholly owned subsidiary of elite Europe. They severed all contact immediately. Terry Venable's problems were not restricted to his choice of advisers. The Spurs deal was now imminent and he urgently needed money. In a final attempt to raise cash, he decided to cheat one of his former companies, Transatlantic Inns, which had run a number of public houses. Macy's is a West End wine bar. It was one of three pubs managed by Transatlantic Inns. The others were the Cock and Magpie in Epping, a traditional country pub, and the Granby Tavern in Reading, a well-known music venue. Transatlantic didn't actually own any of these pubs, but had leased them all from various breweries. Terry Venables resigned as a director of Transatlantic Inns on June the 28th, 1991. Despite this, he entered into a transaction with another company to sell them most of Transatlantic's property. Transatlantic Inns' major assets were the fixtures and fittings in its three pubs. This included things like the bars, tables, chairs and even the pub's carpeting. Panorama has discovered that in August 1991, two months after he'd resigned as a director, Terry Venables arranged to sell and lease back the fixtures and fittings of Macy's, the Cock and Magpie and the Granby Tavern to a company called Landhurst Leasing. He also sold Landhurst the fixtures and fittings of a fourth pub, the Miners in Claremont Road, Cardiff. According to Cardiff Council, this pub, and indeed this road, does not actually exist. Landhurst Leasing's £1 million payment was deposited into Edennote, Terry Venable's private company, not Transatlantic Inns. The money came in three tranches, two instalments of £250,000 and a final payment of half a million pounds. The other transatlantic directors knew nothing of the sale of their assets and they would have been even more astonished to hear that Venables got one million pounds for them. The maximum value of these fixtures and fittings is just over a hundred thousand pounds. That's about ten percent of the price Venables company actually received. According to internal Eden Note documents, £800,000 of the Landhurst leasing money was paid out six days later to Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. This money alone enabled Venables to keep his part of the bargain with Alan Sugar to purchase the Spurs shares. Venables failed to disclose where the money came from. In the original offer document for Tottenham Hotspur, he claimed simply that £750,000 would come from his own resources. Why Landhurst Leasing paid Eden Note £1 million in exchange for assets worth about 100000 is hard to explain. Landhurst were paid a £10,000 arrangement fee, but they also received one other perk from Terry Venables. He instructed Spurs' marketing department to provide Landhurst Leasing with a £20,000 executive box free for the entire season box number 44 in the West Stand. More importantly, Venables had achieved his ambition to become a controlling partner in Spurs. Terry Venables' decision to sell property he didn't own at a vastly inflated price and then put the money into his own company is unlawful. It hurts both the shareholders of Transatlantic Inns and those of Landhurst Leasing. Both companies are now in receivership.
like many football supporters, Spurs fans regard Terry Venables as potentially the next England manager. Tonight's revelations about his unprincipled business practices raise serious questions about that. And now his role as Tottenham Hotspur's chief executive is also being called into question. Besides putting Eddie Ashby on the payroll at Spurs, Venables began to mix his private business interests with those of Tottenham. The insurance company, Legal and General, were in final negotiations with Spurs to sell financial products to the club's supporters. As the deal was about to be closed, another company, General Portfolio, whose chairman was a shareholder in Scribes, suddenly replaced Legal and General. Panorama has obtained correspondence between General Portfolio and Terry Venables. The letter begins by referring to the common aim of increasing Scribes' clientele and generating business for Tottenham Hotspur and General Portfolio. So Venables' club Scribes was to benefit from the deal. During their high court battle, Alan Sugar questioned Terry Venables about invoices that concerned him. They triggered anxieties about the behaviour of the club's chief executive. The first invoice was for a cash sum of £58,750. The invoice said it was for the assistance in arranging a distribution and merchandising network on behalf of Tottenham Hotspur. But the rest of the Spurs board knew nothing about this work. There are two other invoices for services which the board also knew nothing about. One for £11,750 was in respect of commercial consultancy on behalf of Tottenham Hotspur. The other for £17,625 related to commercial and public relation activities. Venables has so far failed to give any further details about this work. Alan Sugar was also concerned about a change to the contract of Chief Scout Ted Buxton. Just before Venables left, he amended Buxton's contract, giving him the right to unilaterally extend the agreement. It eventually read, the company or the Chief Scout may at its option extend the agreement for a further period of two years. This meant that if Buxton was dismissed, Spurs could be forced to pay compensation for an additional two years. Venable's largest payment to an agent involved the sale of Paul Gascoigne to Italian club Lazio. He'd recruited Gascoigne during the summer of 1989, but two years later, with the club in serious debt, Venables was forced to sell him. Although the sale was agreed for the 1991 FA Cup final, Gascoigne suffered a serious knee injury and the price had to be renegotiated. Panorama has obtained a letter dated 20th of June 1991 and sent by Lazio's London-based solicitors to Tottenham Hotspur. It confirmed the Italians would be prepared to pay a price of 5.5 million for Paul Gascoigne. Lazio's finance director, Giancarlo Guerra, confirmed the details of Paul Gascoigne's transfer from Tottenham Hotspur to Italy. When did Lazio reach agreement with Tottenham Hotspur about... Uh, I remember it should be about June 91. A uh, few months uh, Paul uh, uh, in accident at uh, the knees. How much did Lazio agree to pay? 5.5 million pounds. 5.5 million? Yeah. Was this figure ever increased? Never. It was impossible to increase because it was a closed agreement. Uh, all the money was already deposited in a bank and the bank received a trust mandate from Tottenham and Lazio and so it was impossible to change the figure. Despite this agreement, Venables introduced his old friend and Pimlico restaurateur Gino Santini to assist in the negotiations. According to Lazio, he played no part in the early discussions and only met them well after the deal had been struck. A month ago, Venables told the Guardian newspaper that he was able to push up the price for Gaza to £6.3 million. I was helped, he said, by Gino Santini, who eventually wanted some pay. Terry Venables has been quoted in British newspapers as saying that Mr Gino Santini helped push the price for Paul Gascoigne up 
to 6.3 million pounds. Did Lazio pay 6.3 million? No. Lazio pays 5.5 million pounds. Not a penny more? Not a penny more. Despite Lazio's insistence that the price for Gascoigne was never increased, Venables are refused to accept the BBC's normal terms and conditions of interview. His financial advisor, Eddie Ashby, also did not comment. Tonight's revelations may come as a great surprise for Spurs fans who have loyally backed Venables. His abuse of position and his unscrupulous business practice may make even the most ardent supporters think again.